Today, we are going to bring you some new collaborative content with fellow YouTube creator Watch Wes Work. So if you've been following Wes's channel, you saw he recently published a video called Unicorns Are Real. Wes had a local viewer and customer purchase and bring to him a 1995 Dodge 2500 5.9 Cummins four-wheel drive, and she's a beaut. Mint condition, well-maintained, very clean rig. 12-valve, 5.9-liter Cummins with the legendary Bosch P-Pump, P7100 inline injection pump. This truck developed a drivability issue. Wes says 99% of the time, this thing runs flawlessly. When we get full operating temperature and on a very intermittent basis, it will develop a single cylinder misfire. That misfire will then escalate into a multiple cylinder misfire. Then he will experience a stuck throttle, and shortly after that, the engine will die and not restart. And then, uh, give it some time, fire it back up, everything's fine, cycle repeats itself. It started its misfire. It's dead on at least one cylinder. That's gotta be at least two cylinders. Right there, the throttle's stuck on me. My foot's off the pedal. There, it finally came down. Now it's dead. No bounce back. <laughs> There's some kind of a, an apparition in this injection pump. Alright, yeah, we're dead. As you know, Wes is an extremely advanced technician, right? So thorough diagnostic work. I think he's got quite a bit of time trying to figure this one out or at least replicate the problem. He has confirmed quality fuel. He has confirmed appropriate supply fuel pressure. He has confirmed uh, shut off solenoid operation during these events, and beyond that, there's not much left. If the engine's turning, the solenoid's on, and you're feeding it fuel, if it's not running, pretty much going to be in the injection pump. Not a very common complaint on this one. This thing is purely mechanical, uh, with the exception of the electric solenoid. When these things fail, it's generally not intermittent. Usually, mechanical stuff like this breaks and it's broken, it doesn't fix itself again and, and fire back up. Anything that's in the rack sticking, or anything sticking in one or any combination of one or more of the pumping elements, will cause the pump to stay in that fuel delivery mode. Again, we talked about Wes has some sticky throttle issues, so if the rack is sticking or if one of these pumping elements is stuck in a uh, certain orientation, that's where the foot feed's gonna live. All speculation, we won't know until we scatter it and get in there. Looks like potentially someone's been in here before. I, I question that the aneroid has been off. You remove the aneroid and you reveal uh, the fuel plate, which you can make an adjustment or you can replace with a modified or race fuel plate. We don't know if anybody's been in there or uh, what modifications have been done to it at this point. Rest of the pump, probably factory original. So we can see sealing wire there, sealing wire there. I do notice one of the delivery valve holders has got a little bit different uh, metal finish. So I don't know if someone's been in there and replaced that. Not completely out of question for that to be a different color, but uh, potentially a clue. And I don't see any seal paint on the nuts for that. The so O-ring, that's not a Bosch original. Maybe some evidence someone has been here before us. Uh, maybe not. But given the symptoms and scenario, we're probably thinking we've got something sticking. So potentially the rack that controls the fuel delivery, potentially one of the pumping elements, the barrel and plunger, could be intermittently sticking in a temperature-related scenario, or another common one would be shut-off solenoid, but again, Wes confirmed operation of the solenoid. Purely speculation at this point, I have no idea what's wrong with this pump, but we're going to write up a work order, we're going to turn it over to Gary, who is our resident inline pump expert. Gary will get it back in the fuel shop, clean it up, tear it down, inspect, develop a game plan, and then we'll make the fix, tune and calibrate, and we'll meet you back up here. Introduce myself, Gary Dollar. Been working on inline fuel injection pumps at Gary Diesel for 40 years. We got one here from Wes. Watch Wes work. Having an intermittent flutter miss on his engine. RPMs like to take off and run away. Come down and die. Everything indicates he might have a sticky plunger when it gets hot. We've also got other issues with leakages and oil. Diaphragm's bad. We're not just going to assume something and look for it. We're going to take and rebuild the pump. First thing I'm going to do is cap it up, wash it off, blast the paint off it, disassemble it, look for the problem. Hopefully we'll find evidence on a certain plunger. Also, quite obviously, he's got oil leakage at the throttle lever, which has also been bent and hit, so that'll get replaced. Got a break off bolt. It's supposed to be broken off, keep them from tampering. Someone's been inside this, probably adjusted the fuel. Neither here nor there for this complaint. Gotta to totally disassemble it. New casket seal, totally reassemble it. That way we can try to guarantee West that we found this problem and cured it. 
or we did not find a problem and he's got to look somewhere else. Okay, fuel plate, this is an addition. Somebody has changed the fuel plate in this, probably for performance or something. And I'll just mark where it's at. They've obviously wanted to turn the fuel up, so it'll go be put back in the same way it comes out. Not a Bosch part. Have tapered pins, which once they're set, they like to stay. Got it. Well, there's a will, there's a way. It's one of the tapered pins. Once it gets set in, it doesn't want to come out. Now I get the throttle shaft out. Okay, under this condition right now. Rack is totally free. Rack backwards, shut off position. If you want to run it, go forward. Okay, for some reason it sticks, the engine will just keep going up once you let off your load. Runaway condition. Finally, the weights will throw enough pressure, even if one's sticking, pull it back to the shut off position, come down and die. Normally there's enough spring tension to keep it idling. If it's sticking, so I'm still looking for a sticking plunger. Right now the rack's free in a cool condition. Depending on a failure, sometimes a cam will give you a clue. Because I'm paying attention to number three. Look number three lobe. Doesn't appear to have any issues. So now I can take taps out and examine the plungers, which is kind of what I'm after. I haven't found anything yet. Doesn't appear any of the tappets were sticking. Plungers look excellent. Number one. Two looks good. Three, which we're going to examine because of the holder. Looks perfect. Including number six, they all look perfect. So we'll just go ahead and clean it up. Might still find something with the barrel itself, but yeah, so far nothing. Okay, Kurt, we're going after a ugly looking plunger of some sort. Maybe because we're getting cleaner than that brand new. Rack free in the housing? Rack is free for still free. We still have this problem though, so it's twice towards the pump. We'll continue through. Not crazy in the governor in. Nothing about the governor. The whole pump didn't look much better than me so far. But we still gotta concentrate on finding an issue. Number three is still simple black because of the discoloration. This one I've got no number on it. 1238. That's number three. Actually, number one's 1238. Yeah. Okay. That's actually fine. Even though it's discolored, different color, it's not discolored. It is the correct part number, so even though it appeared to be different, it's the same part number. Same old thing. So, kind of eliminates that as an issue right now. We may end up having to just change out the barrel and plungers to cover our butts here. 
customers don't usually like it, but... It's a, a scattergun approach. Not that common in the automotive world. If you don't find it, fix everything. Delivery valves, not causing a sticky plunger. Okay, we're going to keep track of the number one sham. When we get to the building and testing stage, cylinders will all be phase high within 60 degrees of each other. We'll just keep track of one sham for now and we'll fit the other ones on the stand. Okay, this way it's both built. Then inside is the base here. Each barrel has two o rings. It has one on the top, keep fuel from escaping. The way it's built, it's a two-step machining and housing. When these go in, if for some reason, somebody packs extra grease in here, physical characteristics, you're starting with a one size of a one area, the grease will actually get packed. The step in the housing will pack the grease in, causing pressure in this area, which can cause a sticky plunger. I can't eliminate a sticky plunger, but normally it would leave a mark on the plunger. Wherever it got tight here, it causes discoloration on the plunger. We'll just continue this assembly, go to clean up, and rebuild. We'll let our parts manager be in charge of if he gets two barrel plungers or not. Well, we, we talked about the quality of this truck, Wes's customer. This is a mint condition P-pump dog, so uh, the direction from Wes was no expense spared. They want it done right. They want a quality repair. They want something that's going to last for another 20 or 30 years. So um, ask and you shall receive. We're going to spare no expense. This is going to get the full treatment. Which is one of the only ways we can guarantee our product. Always makes us a little nervous when we don't see a smoking gun. That's why we're going to also be in favor of the, the scatter gun approach. Right? Anything that could cause it is going to get replaced with new and uh, shouldn't have any, any concerns after that. Yeah, everything looks really good. Obviously, we've got some age on it. It's a 19, what? 90, 95. 95 truck. It looked like it had uh, stock fuel plate. It looked like anybody been in there. Definitely has an aftermarket fuel plate. Somebody has been in there. But we don't think the modified fuel plate would cause the symptom that he's having. No, but again, you can never, ever tell. Yeah. I like to build stock pops to stock specs with stock parts. That's not always the case. We can't always get the correct parts. But any kind of modification, any way or the other, with an RTV governor. 7,100 pumps, good, solid. But the governor is extremely touchy. This arm, which is inside here, it goes up and down with different speeds. Could possibly be in a condition where it gets stuck underneath this plate when it's supposed to be on the top of the plate, following a fuel curve for different rates of fuel at different speeds. Could possibly get stuck underneath it and cause it to stick and cause some of these issues. So that can't be ruled out as one of the problems. Would it lack power if that lever got stuck under the fuel plate? It could have more power, less power. It could do anything. Mm -hmm. It's just not the way Robert Bosch built it. Just leaves me with questions because I don't know who yeah, so did it, why they did it. When did the problem start? Did this start immediately after that was modified? Again, we don't know. Wes's customer is a new owner of this truck. Um, so we don't know much history prior to that. How long has it been doing this? Under what circumstances did it occur? We don't know. We don't have a full backstory. But yep. we also do that modification and then go to a calibration stand. Though yeah. this was likely done under the, the shade tree on yep. the truck. So yep. uh, it's an acceptable upgrade. It happens millions. I mean, there's millions of these aftermarket fuel plates sold. But like Gary said, as soon as you wander from the factory calibration, factory bill of materials, you've opened up a whole new can of worms. So. So now we'll try to make it a little more reliable, whatever it takes. It's been nice to find a smoking gun with a start up plunger, a discolored plunger. We can replace the bad plunger, be 99% confident of the repair. Since we haven't found anything yet, and he's got what sounds to be a sticking plunger at high, you know, at warm temperatures, even though there's no evidence yet, we'll clean these up and maybe find something later. But uh, so far, don't see any issues. <laughs> Sorry, Wes. Clean up time. But even look at this right here. See yeah. That discoloration. Yeah. A nudge right there. But until it actually sticks, now when it heats up, it can stick. And that's what I'm looking at that mark for. Yeah. You can see it even from over here. And what I was going to show you when I was putting it together. Okay, the furthest up it ever goes is that. And basically to there. Right. And it goes down to maybe there. So, the grease points right here. Which is right where that's at. So it could be something as simple as they just had grease in between the two O-rings. 
just squeeze a little bit on it. And it could also be a mismanufactured plunger. What, the, were any of the others have any sign of? Okay, I'm looking right here. I can just get pretty damn picky. Right, you can't. That one you can see it on. Yeah, you can't compare it to that one. So that one doesn't have marks. Not really, maybe just a faint. So unless the brand spanker new, they're going to have marks. But there's a little something. Yep. That's pretty good. Pretty clean. Pretty clean. Basically, when it gets hot, it starts missing. It sounds like the rack starts sticking and it comes down and dies, won't restart. Pull up a couple of older bulletins, not necessarily on this pump, going back to 95, another one 1995, 96. Okay, starting out with, it's a Navstar, which this is a Cummins, but same principles. Again, this is on a 3000 series Navstar. Ours is a 7000 series Cummins. All the basics get back to the same thing. Okay, there have been reported cases of sticky elements and or rack on Bosch P-pumps. Condition generally manifests itself when the pump or engine is hot and result in any or all the following conditions. Including stuck rack, knocking noise, erratic engine operation, miss, surge, or stall, which Wes is having pretty much all of those, hard start or no start condition, which he ended up running into after his rack started sticking. And again, this pertains more or less to nav stars, and there it was between 1,000 and 40,000 hours, no particular cylinder. Duplication of the condition, especially hot, may be noted on the test stand. It might take three months to note it on the test stand, like it took Wes to find on his truck. Okay, 95.2, which is about six months after this one, they try to explain to you there's a pressure buildup between two lower barrel O-rings, which is over here. Basically one lower o-ring here, lower o-ring here. Still baffling here, which doesn't have anything to do with it. Upper o-ring, which just keeps going out of the pump. Grease is getting caught between them two o-rings. Okay, when it gets pushed into the housing, <laughs> top o-ring goes up here, bottom o-ring's going here. And depending on the camera, and what you can see and can't see. Right down in here, there's a stepped bore. There's a step right here. So basically, grease gets caught in this area here, the top land. O-ring keeps it from going past down into the pump. The top o-ring, any grease that's caught in that land right there gets pushed into the smaller land, causing a hydraulic line. So when we build this thing up, and we'll get into it later when we actually build it, we have to pay attention not to get grease trapped. Okay, when we land them two O-rings, again, it's hard to tell, but this O-ring is tighter, the barrel, than this one is in its groove. Any grease trapped right in here loses its room in here, in the housing. It gets packed in here, and what we're looking at, number one, Right here are two discoloration marks. So we're going with the complaints that Wes has, the conditions of this particular plunger, correct the problem. Normally we would just rebuild the pump, light on the grease, probably cure the problem. We're going to replace all the barrel and plungers and anything else we can do to keep it from having a sticking plunger again. Okay, we also found, it is just pulled down nuts and clamps from the barrel and plungers. Again, you have to pay attention to everything. This one's hard to see too. The backside's a lot easier to see. Something was trapped underneath that clamp and nut when it was built, or somebody's been mucking with a pump. And it actually even put a little hairline crack in it, which, again, it's not going to affect anything. A piece of dirt on top of that, when it gets put together, is not going to hurt anything. If a piece of dirt would get caught underneath these spacing shims, which are used for timing the pump cylinders, if a piece of dirt got caught under here, between the housing and the shim, it would tilt this, cause them binding in this barrel plunger again, which could cause a sticky plunger. So, we'll just replace this shim. Probably wasn't affecting his condition, but we got to pay attention to everything when we rebuild this pump. Down to the point of the shims, there's one under each plunge here, marked 145 on that one. So the other side has to have exactly the same shim, so it doesn't create a bad binding situation again, which can cause a sticky plunger and all of the symptoms that Wes has had. Several things involved. We're concentrating on the barrel plungers. We might have had a faulty barrel plunger produced at the factory, some inconsistencies in it, but to cover our bases, we're going to replace all six barrel plungers and totally rebuild the pump with new gaskets and seals. We try to lay everything out organized style just to keep things moving along as I'm building it. These are the old barrel plungers. We'll reuse the delivery valves. Another thing while we're starting, show me on the disassembly. Had an aftermarket fuel plate in it. I can tell by the numbering on it. Okay, according to Bosch specs, the 24009 stamping, that's the correct fuel plate for an 838 pump, which is what I'm building. So we're going back with a stock plate. We're going to give him some extra fuel, which just means we're going to bump this up a little bit when we adjust the fuel. This is going out. We're not taking any chances on anything causing us problems. We're building a stock pump. Slight increase in fuel. We're also going to replace this shutoff cell. So again, probably not causing his problem. It would just cause a non start problem if it wasn't working if it failed it could shut it off but it wouldn't ever cause a sticking rack which is one of wes's problems along with a miss but it's going to get replaced also okay the control rack through various parts control segment being one of them it's going to hook all six barrel and plungers together so in this case here, we're having an issue with number one, it appears. If number one has an issue where it starts to stick, first thing is going to happen, if that plunger sticks in an up position, it's going to start causing a miss on number one. Because the plunger is stuck up in the barrel, it's not coming down, not getting a chance to charge, not pumping fuel. Okay, if one of those plungers gets tight, all of them are hooked together. So in Wes's condition, the plunger is getting stuck, causing a miss. 
It's causing the rack not to move, which is going to cause RPMs to maybe go up, maybe go down, depending on where it's stuck, fuel or no fuel. So even though number one is missing, not pumping, the others are still pumping fuel wherever the rack stopped at. So at first it may cause the engine to take off and run away, which is one of Wes's complaints, excess of RPMs. Well then, when you get enough weight pressure, even though the plunger's tight, it's actually going to still get pulled to shut off position, causing all the five that are still pumping to quit pumping fuel, causing an engine dying, stalling situation, which is what Wes is having. Once it cools down, okay, it's not starting, it got in a no start condition, okay, once it sat for a while, cool down a little bit, number one, unfreezes, wrap, turns free again, it'll go ahead and start again, run again, until one of the plunger sticks again. We think that's what's happening with the West, so as I built this pump, every step I take is going to make sure that this rack is free. Okay, if it ever gets to a situation where I put a plunger in, put a barrel in, and, and the rack gets tight, got to pay attention to what's causing it to get tight, rack has to stay free for two or three hundred thousand more miles, hopefully. Okay, first process, we're just putting the baffle ring on, two clips. The next step will be installing the new O-rings, assembling each unit. Barrels and plunges will be kept as mates now. Make sure they're free. They should drop on their own weight. Use extreme caution not to cause any imperfections, any dents, any nicks, any of the surfaces on this plunger. Barrels are a little bit tougher. First thing we'll do, install a new gasket for the delivery valve. Delivery valve, spring assembly, new O-ring. Just enough grease to coat the O-rings. Nothing excessive, nothing visible between the O-rings. You can tell, smaller diameter, larger diameter. If you pack grease in here, all the grease gets forced into that smaller area. It will cause a tight spot on the plunger. This will be dropping the housing, matching shims, push them in later. Each of these barrels, have oval slots in them, allowing them to go back and forth on the studs just a little bit. That'll be used to balance our fuel deliveries on the test stands. You turn each one of these plungers on the control segments, you're actually turning the plunger inside the barrel, which is causing this helix. It's lined up with charging ports underneath a baffle sleeve there. Plungers rotated this direction. We have a small effective stroke, low delivery for idle, perhaps. And as you get the rack gets rotated, the plungers get rotated to a longer effective stroke. Same way this gets changed for low delivery to high delivery, you can turn the barrel and accomplish the same thing. That's what we'll do to balance the deliveries, main deliveries, the actual idle, mid-range, start deliveries, control by the rack. It has to be free to go from the full delivery to the shut-off delivery. If it sticks anywhere, it's either going to run away or it's going to die. And that's one of the situations we're trying to correct right now in West's pub. Install the control sleeves. The all six sleeves are in register with the rack. Feel free. Upper spring seats, two springs. Of course, the plungers are still not in their segments yet, it's up on their springs. We're going to have to compress the springs inside the housing to be able to get our tappets and cam in. This is a bracket that we're going to use to compress our tappets. You can see. Can't put the cam through there. Same type of tools we use to disassemble the pumps. Now, as I compress the tappets and plungers, the plungers have to get engaged in the control sleeve. So it's just a matter of hitting this. There it's in, call the tool. Make sure the rack's free. The number one plunger in this condition here, of course, it's a brand new plunger. Pump's cool. Rack's free. We'll just go down the line. Give a little more clearance yet for the cam. Okay, now this condition here, we're going to actually push further up in the housing than the cams you're going to ask for. It could cause the rack to be tight right now. Now we'll go ahead and put our front bearing end plate in, straight bearing. We'll grease it up before putting it in. We'll pre-lube it. Just a little bit. Pre-lube this one with grease. All new O-rings. We tap it tilt up, the cam ought to slide right in. Okay, our center cam bearing 
It's secured with stretch bolts, and they need to replace every time you rebuild the pump. They have their own lock height on them. Gonna get snug tight, and then a 90 degree stretch. Man, can't should be free. It is, no in play. Up to 4,000, but closer to none. The measure protrusion on it, it's not adjustable on a 7,000 series, but it still needs to fall at 13 and a half millimeter range. On a 13.4, which is in steps. You, know, you don't want the taper in the front of the pump sticking too far in the engine. You also don't want it too far back in the pump, causing governor problems. So we'll take the pressure off the tappet tools now. All the tappet spring pressure now is on the cam. Can't rotate the cam without it breaking now. The rack needs to be free. And we'll secure the bottom. The pump build is pretty much complete now. We're going to start assembling the governor to it. The pump installed. Next will be the flyweight assembly, which we also have to take into consideration. This adjusts our timing. We're on a cushion drive. So however we secure that to the cam is going to determine where our timing is at. First thing we're going to do is put this tool on the front end of the cam. Basically a six and a quarter degree offset tool for the end. Whenever we attach this tight, it's going to give us a timing of 13 degrees on the engine, which is stock for this pump. So the cam secured in the position I want it to be in, I can lock this to the camshaft now. Mount it on rubber cushions, just to isolate camshaft vibration from the flyweights. Okay, we're going to use Loctite just on the threads. The actual taper is dry. Here's just a very short general description of how the flyweights work in this pump. There's three different positions. There's a start position, an idle governor, and a top end governor. Everything in the middle is controlled with foot feed pressure, throttle pressure. First set of these weights is just for the start position. Runs by rack follower. When it gets underneath the fuel plate, again we're going back to the stock Bosch fuel plate. This pump here it never goes underneath the plate to go to start. It's always in the range here or on one of the fuel ramps. Okay. Position of these weights is the idle governor. The last position is the full load governor. You get on the high speed springs. So we'll take the weights, put them in position. Time your positioner has slots in it also for fine tuning on the stand. Whatever the tool doesn't get perfectly. So we'll attach it. We'll have another break off bolt for once our timing is set. We'll break the head of that bolt off so that no one else can mess with the timing. Position this in the middle bit slots. Having pin. We'll engage it with a pointer on the weights. Spacer washer. These have to be on the rubber cushions when it's done and not locked to the cam. If it's locked to the cam, the spacer's too thin, the weights, better vibration of the pump, could back the nut off. If you lose control of your weight, your weights can't sense the speed of the pump. And your engine can run away, it can do all sorts of things. Once we torque this in, we'll make sure that that's got some freedom. Then lock tight on the threads. And we still have freedom to move under the cushion, so that's good. These move without that moving. Cushions don't apply to the pointer. We move the pointer. Otherwise, if we rotate the pump, we'll break our pointer. Okay. okay, we have another adjustment. Position of the sleeve in relation to the weights. It's transfer movement. Set the go, no go gauge is just a touch out adjustment to make this shorter after an adjustment. Okay, click the pin back in place. First portion of it's complete. Reassemble some of the rest of it. Middle portion is complete. Now we're going to work on the cover. If you remember on disassembly, one of the issues we found was bent throttle shaft. Also has wear at the seal area, which would cause one causing an oil leak. So throttle shaft's going to be replaced. You also remember the guide block assembly, which is attached to this, has tapered pins. Once they're installed, they're hard to get out. We had trouble getting one of them out. We actually damaged, destroyed the guide block. Gonna replace it with new. I looked on our Bosch parts lists. There's maybe 50 or 75 different guide block assemblies. So you really need to use the correct one, the right part number. Bosch. Okay, we're gonna replace the throttle shaft with new. It'll get pinned to this new block. When it does, we're gonna have to dream the holes out. Right now, those are straight drilled holes. The pin won't even fit in either direction. 
The location of the throttle shaft, throttle lever, keyway, important. Direction of the guide block and the pump's important. We get put on that direction there. Drill from the backside along with the key. So here we have the reamer to match the pins. Two watt reamer. Using it as a drill. It has to do with experience and knowing what you're going to do. How deep to drill it. Start with the outer one. Okay, so I have one of them finally through. This new block is tough as the old one was getting it apart. First one set, we'll match the second one to the first one. Then we'll let the epoxy set up a little bit on it and we'll install the shaft. Right block, new pins, and we'll be ready to install this to that. Pretty much completes the gambler cover. Rack's still free, both directions. It's worth buttoning up. Stock fuel plate. Pretty much the complete build up. Mounting flanges, test hubs, and we'll be ready to test it. Okay, we're gonna set this up on the test stand now. We're gonna basically be, you know, thinking about Wes's problem the whole time about a sticky rack, especially once it starts getting warmed up a little bit. One of the main things, again, this is a rubber posh test spec, which I transferred to our sheets of paper. We're gonna have a certain number test nozzle, have to have a certain number test line, and then we'll have a dial indicator running the rack. Fortunately, now the control rack is trying to keep free, so we'll know if it's in the shutoff with the full rack. For any of my different settings, and of course we'll be looking for any kind of leaks, just anything on, we would normally be looking for on a test stand. We'll set our timing, set our RPMs, high idle, low idle, adjust our fuel. Again, we're going to set it maybe with 10% of the specs. I'm not going to change the top plate, we're using a Bosch top plate, just to eliminate any kind of other interferences and problems. Uh, we'll fill it up with oil ourselves. We don't run oil pressure on the test stand. We want it to take too long to fill up, and it would end up being too full of oil for what we want on the test stand. So we'll get her set up, and we'll be ready to show you how we're going to test it. We've got a high pressure phase or timing. They need to be 60 degrees apart in the firing order. If we use high pressure, it'll also be a good time to watch for leaks. If it's ever going to leak, a leak here under 200 to 300 pounds. On the engine, it may be running 20 to 30 pounds. We have to have a mid rack setting on our dial indicator gauge, which later on, the dial indicator will also be telling us if our rack is free or stuck. So the first thing we'll do is set our timing. Six and a quarter degrees past, we're aiming up to 13 degrees, which is back. Loosen our adjustable window, dial in, retract the reversible pin, we'll put it in the out position. So the timing is complete, we'll move on to the balance of the fuel and oil.
just stop balancing it. We might go for a perfection and be here for tomorrow. We have a very set in the world of integration. I'll record it and I'll go down and check the balance on it. I did the delivery. I'm going to set it. I'm going to set it over. I'm going to make, keep it from stalling because of the faulty solenoid. We're just going to install a new one. And Wes, if you're involved in watching this, I am putting brake off bolts in there, not to keep you out, or keep anybody out, but if anybody goes into it, I'm going to know it. Okay, production is complete. One more seal. Then we will take and paint it now.
All right, here it is. You watch Gary perform his craft on this injection pump for Wes. He's done a fine job. Gary's been with Area Diesel for almost 40 years. Almost all of those years focused on these inline Bosch pumps. And his level of experience, I would say, would rival anyone in the industry. So we definitely have the right guy on task for this project. And I'm very confident we have this one whipped back into shape. So what was wrong? Uh, oddly, almost nothing. And if it hadn't been for Wes's detailed description of the symptoms, we might have fixed this one without even having known it. And we'll dive into kind of what I'm talking about there. But this thing was in fantastic condition. You could tell it had been well taken care of. Quality of fuel that had been run through it throughout its life was good. Oil was maintained and changed regularly. This pump was in pretty darn good condition. Good, detailed set of circumstances, complaints, symptoms is paramount in our ability to diagnose, fix, repair, and understand what's going on with these pumps. So sometimes people think we might ask a little bit too many questions, but there's a reason that we're doing that. So we're trying to get a thorough understanding of what is going on and what is being experienced with the pump. Fortunately, in this situation, Wes even went to the extent of sending us a video live in action while this thing was acting up. So again, remember the conditions, the symptoms were very intermittent with this pump during a high temperature, so high ambient temperature, fully up to operating temperature engine, so fully heat soaked pump, this thing would exhibit its problem very intermittently. Wes had lots of miles trying to replicate the issue, but what he would find is at full operating temperature on a hot day, this thing would develop a single cylinder misfire. That problem would evolve, increase into a multiple cylinder misfire event, and then he would lose throttle control, so the throttle would stick on him, and then after that, uh, the engine would start to die and cut out completely. That's got to be in these two cylinders. Right there, the throttle stuck on me. My foot is off the pedal. There, it finally came down. Now it's dead. No, bounce back. Soon. It's dead. All right. So the big thing to pay attention to is the fuel pressure gauge. As far as I can tell, it has good fuel pressure. Yeah, so it bounces all over the place, but that's not unusual. Yeah, so you still, still have fuel pressure when it died. It's really hard to see on this gauge. We need a fluid-filled gauge that damps out the pulses of mechanical pump. But the long story short is that the, uh, the supply fuel pressure seems to be fine. You can see what this thing was doing. After it died, it was a hard restart. It wouldn't restart until things cooled off a little bit, and then it would fire back up and the cycle would repeat. Get all the way warmed up, start to mess and sputter, uh, throttle would stick, she'd die and cut out. Uh, Wes was monitoring supply fuel pressure during these events. That's always suspect number one. Are you feeding the pump quality fuel at the right pressure? Wes, as you know, is an expert and he confirmed this. Uh, the other thing would have been solenoid operation. So is the shutoff solenoid fully turning the pump on or is it getting weak and starting to shut off the pump, which can replicate some of the same issues? Wes had confirmed both of those things already. Supply fuel was good and at the right pressure, solenoid was acting correctly and that pretty well narrows it down to an injection pump issue. There's a million parts in there and outside of this solenoid, the rest of this pump is purely mechanical. And as you may know, mechanical things tend to not be intermittent, right? They're either worn out or broken, and those conditions don't change. Because of that information, because of the detailed symptoms and video from Wes, we start to get a pretty good understanding of, of what we believe was going on with this pump. And interestingly, there is a bulletin. Gary remembers receiving this bulletin. This bulletin is dated 1995, uh, the same year, I believe, as this truck. And we'll pop this bulletin up and let you have a look at it. This is the smoking gun in this scenario. And the reason I say we would have fixed this, even if we didn't have all of that information, is because of what this bulletin alludes to. And the situation, the problem with this pump uh, was really pretty minor. We're talking about an issue with effectively a $1 O-ring inside of this pump. And what happens, there's two O-rings on this barrel and plunger. So this is the business end of the pump. This is the pumping element. This is what makes the fuel delivery. The camshaft turns in the pump, pushes this element in and out pumps fuel out to the injector. The problem with this pump, one of these O-rings had either started to fail or failed, and they looked fine, or over the course of 25 or 27 years, diesel fuel had crept in between these two O-rings, or potentially during assembly 27 years ago, calibration fluid or assembly grease 
was in between these two O-rings. That fluid, whatever it may have been, or a bad O-ring, captures fluid in between these O-rings, and when that fluid expands, it squeezes in the barrel of the pumping element and sticks it. So this one was just starting to develop this complaint, this symptom, and it would have gone on undoubtedly to get worse. We can see on the plunger, one of the plungers shows evidence of sticking, and that's what was going on. When this pump got to full operating temperature, whatever schmoo was in between these O-rings was expanding enough in the cavity to squeeze the barrel and seize the plunger. When you watch Wes's video, you can see it happen. That engine is becoming increasingly hot and warm, and as it does, that schmoo expands and that plunger sticks. When that plunger sticks, that cylinder begins to misfire, and because it's stuck and the rack and the foot feed are what control the orientation of the plunger, when it sticks, the throttle sticks, and you lose foot feed input to the injection pump. Once it sticks, then you'll see the engine will sputter out and die, and it's dead in the water until he pulls over, lets it cool off, this plunger will become unstuck, fire it back up, and then the cycle repeats. Heat it up enough until the schmoo expands again, squeezes the plunger inside of the barrel, seizes it, and the process repeats. When I was talking earlier about the fact we would have repaired this without even knowing it, that's because these plungers always come out and these O-rings always get replaced, and our experts know not to put grease or lube or whatever in between those O-rings because this is a known thing, not very common. It's a good thing that, that Gary's been here for 40 years. It's a good thing that Gary remembers getting this bulletin 27 years ago, and he's seen it throughout his experience, and we believe confidently that was the situation with this pump. Mechanically, outside of that one small spot on one barrel and plunger, the plungers looked fantastic. Camshaft, excellent. Bearings, excellent. Housing, fantastic. Governor, weights, springs, all looked great. Throttle lever we talked about earlier, she got damaged in shipping. This would have been replaced regardless. Where the seal rides, there's a groove like any other lip seal. Over time, that seal will wear into the shaft. That seal was leaking prior to this thing having been bent in shipping. New barrels and plungers, all six of them. New throttle shaft, guide bushing for the throttle shaft. So you can see during the disassembly process, this got hammered pretty hard. That's not uncommon. Replace that. Driving the tapered pins out of there can sometimes be a bear. This one got strapped. No big deal. Originally when we were at the parts counter, we suspected someone might have been in this pump before. And when Gary got into it, we confirmed it. So this pump had a common upgrade in a fuel plate. This is an aftermarket fuel plate. And this fuel plate fits in the governor, and this ramp is basically what limits rack travel. So this is a in-the-field method of increasing fuel delivery in these injection pumps. Given the circumstances, we wanted to get back to a baseline as stock as possible pump to ensure that we've got a thorough repair, give Wes a baseline. If he puts this back on and in some slight chance still has an issue, we can say confidently it's not at the pump. you got other fish to fry. We'll send this back. If they want to monkey with it, uh, that's on them. Our recommendation is leave this out. This pump has been calibrated for a pretty conservative increase in fuel delivery, roughly what we suspect this fuel plate would have allowed, but our recommendation is get rid of this. This is for people that are not fuel shops, that don't have calibration equipment, so they can increase fuel delivery in the field. We're a pump shop. We've got test stands and calibration equipment. We can achieve the same results in a more consistent and preferred method rather than using this fuel plate. So we'll send it back. They can do with it what they want. New solenoid, still performing correctly, but after 27 years, it doesn't owe anybody a dime. We're going to put a new unit on there. We use a quality Woodward shutoff solenoid on these pumps. No issues there. Outside of those hard parts, we're talking common service items. So a couple of gasket kits, all the seals and washers, you know, the common sealing components and wear items and bushings and things of that nature. Elaborate repair, interesting and complex failure and diagnosis. I thought it was pretty neat. I think that's pretty cool to watch these components come in and watch an expert do their thing on them. Very happy with the way this thing turned out. Again, we talked about factory delivery it was 155 cubic millimeters of fuel. Gary got it turned up to 170, so a 10% increase over the stock calibration. Again, roughly what we suspect this fuel plate would have been doing, but we feel like we've done it in a better manner. Six new barrel and plungers. They looked fantastic. That one little dull spot where the one plunger was sticking would not have been an issue. In this scenario, the determination was made to put new barrel and plungers in this pump. Uh, and why is that? Well, this truck, as you've seen on West Channel, is pristine, right? This is like a near mint condition, 95 Dodge, and they want this thing done absolutely as perfectly as possible. So they got 27 years out of it the first time. It's off the truck. It's in our hands. The statement of spare no expense was made. Do it right. We don't want to do it again. Scatter gun approach. We're going to do everything we believe that will put this thing back in service for another 40 years out there. No expense spared. New Bosch barrel and plungers. So, so again, there'll be kind of two versions of this content. And if you would, drop us a comment below. Let us know which version is your preference. If you're not already following Wes's channel, 
please go over there and check him out. We'll drop you a link to see his channel. You can go over there, watch this pump get reinstalled on the engine, and see if we've corrected the issues. I'm confident we have. All right, if you need to get a hold of us, please reach out. We do pumps, injectors, turbochargers, engine kits, sensors, emissions components, all types of diesel-related components and accessories. If you need to get a hold of us, you can call us at 800-637-2658. That one phone number rings all three of our locations in Illinois, Indianapolis, and Iowa, where you'll have immediate access to a diesel engine expert. You can drop us an email at parts at areadiesel.com, or you can log on to our website at areadieselservice.com, where you can find lots of valuable resources and information, look up parts and cross-references, and you can chat instantly through the button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen with one of those diesel engine experts. Whatever's easiest for you, we're here to try and help. If you do find yourself in need of something, and you mention to us that you learned of us through this collaborative effort with fellow YouTube creator Watch West Work, we'll cover the shipping on your parts or project, and we'll throw in a pair of area diesel mechanics gloves, or whatever other swag we have in stock at the time. That's it. Thanks for watching. There's your problem, lady.